this is Amina and today we are reading a very interesting and sweet book called John's Whistle. So let's get started. Um, just FYI, this book has some amazing illustrations, so please make sure to pay special attention to all the wonderful pictures in this book. John had whistled since he was little. In fact, his first word wasn't a word at all. It was a whistle. His grandparents, his aunts and uncles, and his closest neighbors said that it was something that had been in his family for a long, long time. One of his ancestors had been famous for his way of whistling. The problem was that when John was at the age when other children began to speak, John didn't. And as he grew up, whenever he wanted to ask for something or express how he felt, he could only whistle. Time passed and John's whistles began to develop into different sounds. He eventually had enough to fill a dictionary of unique sounds. A sharp whistle called people's attention, a louder whistle signaled that he was angry, and an even louder one escaped when he was frightened. John blew short whistles when he was sad and long, sweet whistles when he was happy. He blew a gentle, playful little whistle when he wanted to say I love you and a deeper, more serious sounding whistle when he wanted to j say just the opposite. Look at these pictures of John whistling. From the moment John began to whistle, a gazillion birds flocked into his street, garden, and even his house. His exasperated mother tried to chase them off with her broom, but the birds just kept coming back. Each one had its own song with its own meaning, much like John's whistle. Sometimes they seemed to be talking to each other, and at other times they would blend their voices into a breathtaking a cappella symphony. But the grown-ups in the village didn't see it this way, and they soon got fed up with so much noise, but not the children. They loved it and wished they could sing and whistle too. It was easy to see or hear why the children wanted to whistle like John. Even when the wind blew, blew down in strong gusts from the top of the mountain and wove between cottonwoods, it was possible to hear John's whistle from far, far away. His whistle had a power all on its own. It was as simple as that. But as wonderful as everyone else thought this whistle was, John's mother and father were anxious for him to learn to read and write. Although they worried that he may be at a disadvantage because he didn't speak like the other kids, they knew he had to go to school. And there is John with his bird friends. So John went off to school and he listened. He opened his huge amber eyes, paid attention and listened. Nobody knew for sure if he was learning or what he was learning, but he listened and listened more carefully than anyone else. When the school nurse heard about John's whistle, she took him to the most distinguished specialists in the city. And what happened? Nothing. His inability to speak remained an absolute mystery. Even his teachers were captivated by his innocent expression and the incredible way he had of associating a whistle which, with each new thing he learned. If they were to learn about a river, John thought about where it began, how long it was, where it went, and where it entered the sea. And then he heard its voice, the voice of that river, and he told its story as only he could, by whistling. If they were learning about trees, John would picture the way a branch John would picture the way the branches moved in his mind, and his whistling would accompany their graceful dance. If they were learning about triangles, John would draw the shapes in the air with long whistles and silent pauses. With poems and stories, he was incredible. His whistles were like echoes that could move listeners to tears or laughter. As the teachers saw that John enjoyed learning and that his whistles actually helped the other kids rather than distract them, they allowed him to stay in the classroom. John's friend Taleb didn't go to John's school, so he was surprised to see him sitting in the corridor with his dad one afternoon. He was even more surprised when he found out that Taleb now would be going to John's school. They would be in the same class and they would sit at the same desk. At first, Taleb didn't talk either, but he was very good at drawing. Looking at Taleb's beautiful sketches, John could see the way the desert glimmered in the sun, how pretty Taleb's house was, how many brothers he had, and how much he loved olives. 
there are two friends. They became quite the unique team because, of course, John loved music and he discovered that Taleb had another hidden talent as well. Just how John discovered this was all thanks to their teacher, who one day told the class where Taleb was from, how a drought had forced him to leave his home and that Taleb was an amazing at playing bender. John had no idea what a bender was, but Taleb demonstrated by tapping his hands on the table gently at first and gradually playing faster and louder. That was when John's whistle filled the air, soaring and leaping in time to the rhythm. It invited everyone to clap and dance. The class turned into a party like it always did when John whistled. There's Taleb and John. And so John and Taleb became inseparable in their music and in their friendship until the day John discovered that Taleb had feelings for Claire, the girl with dark eyes as dark as night who had caught John's eyes. When Taleb realized it, he stopped drawing immediately. John was upset with his friend, but he knew Taleb meant no harm. One Saturday morning, Claire and John bumped into each other on the street. Claire asked him to go with her into the woods on the mountainside to look for a bag of chestnuts. John felt as if a spring of mountain water was washing over his face, and nervously at first they set off. When large, locks, when large rocks blocked their path, John would stretch out his hand and help Claire clamber over them. When there were thistles, he stretched his arm gently around her waist and helped her avoid them. The sun blazed away, high in the sky, getting hotter and hotter. So they dove into the shade of the woods like fish into the lake. And once they had cooled down a little, they began to play hide and go seek among the trees. For the first time on the whole trek, they burst out laughing. Then Claire wanted to hide further into the woods. I wonder if she's behind that tree, thought John. She wasn't. Or that one? No luck. Or maybe the one over there? Still no luck. Spinning around on his heels, he tried to call Claire with the special whistle he'd created just for her. But he couldn't. How strange. Where was his whistle? What had happened to it? John began to run around, becoming more and more frightened. Was Claire in danger? Was she lost? He, slop, he stopped abruptly. He tried to whistle again. Nothing. His lips had decided that they wouldn't do what he wanted them to do. Suddenly, he heard the crunching of dry leaves. Then, while he was listening, something unexpected, something miraculous happened. John suddenly felt an unfamiliar storm rising in his throat. From behind a majestic chestnut tree, Claire ran towards John and hugged him as hard as she could for a very long time. Then, their eyes met and they were never separated again. The bag of chestnuts was forgotten, but John's whistle wasn't. People say it didn't disappear completely. They say that from time to time, people ask him to do his magic, that each time he whistles, they can still see birds flying in the sky and that, his wh that he whistles while Taleb plays the bender, and they make beautiful music together in the village square. And that brings us to the end of that sweet book about friendship and helping each other and treasuring people for who they are and for their unique talents. I hope you enjoyed this book, and I will see you again very soon with another book. Till then, take care. Bye-bye.